Now you will take air in through the left nostril. Then you will hold it and you will let it out the right nostril. Then you will take air in the right nostril, hold it, let it out the left nostril. That is, you will change over nostrils before exhalation, not before inhalation. So it's, now, during the time you're doing this, watch this whole process, you will visualize, and this is where one-pointedness becomes very important. When you're taking in through your left nostril, you will visualize energy going in your nose and down the left-hand side of your spine to the bottom of your spine. Visualize a long U. And then what happens from where you're sitting, the left side, you start down the U, breathing in the left nostril, then across when you're holding, then let it up and out the right, then in and down the right, across, up and out the left. In and down the left, across, up and out the right, in and down the right, across, up and out the left. Now, what you're doing by doing this is sensitizing yourself to two nerves called the Ida and Pingala, or two sensory pathways. And you will start, at first you'll just fantasy that you're doing this, later on you'll start to actually experience those places. You'll, you'll start to get, I'll tell you, when I go let my breath out, I hear, I feel a vrrr. It's just like a, somebody runs their finger up your spine at first, and then it gets even more powerful later on. Now, the key important place is during the hold that you keep your consciousness right at the bottom of your spine. Right? That's the key one. So that you start in, in, you take in on a count of four, hold on a count of two, let out on a count of eight, hold two. In four, hold two, out eight, hold two. In four, hold two out eight, hold two. Then I'll tell you what the next exercise is, even though you only do these three for a while. All right. Now, t a count of four means it's roughly four seconds. The Vedas talk about the way of measuring it as you go around your knee and snap your fingers is one way of doing it. You can do it, you could do it one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. You can do it It's about the same thing. It's roughly counts of, uh, 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 right? So it's in, two, three, four, hold, two, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, hold, two, in, two, right? It's like Arthur Murray. <laughs> Wulbun uh, closed, head, neck, and chest in straight line. Third finger on the forehead, take in on the left, let out on the right, in on the right, let out on the left. Consciousness goes down the spine, across, and up. Do five of them, five rounds. In these three, then, in the first one, you'll do five, then six, then seven, up to 50. And you do 50 a day. In the second one, you do two units of 30 seconds each. 
Later, after a few weeks, you can make it four units of 30 seconds each. The third one, you start with five rounds, and then you increase that one up to 50 rounds. That's the slowest one. The whole thing will take you about 20 minutes when you're doing the full round. It's a way of calming your mind. It's a way of centering. It's a way of getting your body lightened. It's a way of calming your breath. It's a way of changing your blood, which will ultimately start to affect your diet. Don't underestimate its power. Very, very, very useful technique. After you have been doing this for a while, sufficiently long, so that you are feeling those nerves in your spine, and so that you can keep your mind one-pointed, then you move to the next one, which is where you retain the breath for longer periods of time. For this one, it is good to have somebody around who is doing it and who has done it before and knows about it and can guide you a little bit if you have any problems or be able to ask somebody if you run into any problems. You should be able to have somebody, a checker, when you're doing the more advanced breathing. It's called anu, um, Anulom Bulom. And in Anulom Bulom, you, I'll just tell you what it is so you can know anyway, even though I don't think you want to undertake it unless you have fulfilled these things I've been telling you about. You would close the Mulbund and Udianbund, and then you will take in the air on four Then you close the Julinda Bund, which is the, by putting the neck, the chin against the neck, like this. So you close this, this, and that. And then you hold the breath for a count, say you might do 4, 16, 8, 2. And then you'll get to 6, 32, 10, 2 and then up to 64, and then 128, and so on. Now, the secret of that one, that's the powerful one, in the sense that that's the one that'll take you into samadhi, just force you right into samadhi, if you can do it. But the if is big, and the if requires that you can make your mind totally one-pointed. And the way the game works is, you're holding your breath, and you've got this closed and this closed, and you're holding it, and you start to feel that pressure, and if you feel like you're holding your breath, that means your attention isn't where it's supposed to be, which is at the bottom of your spine. And now the game is, can you keep your attention at the bottom of the spine at the same time as you're holding your breath without attending to holding your breath? That's what the whole secret is. It's easy to keep your mind one-pointed when there's no pressure. The question is, can you keep your one mind one-pointed when there is pressure? It's like fasting. Can you keep your mind one-pointed when you're hungry? And in the same way, the way it's written up in the Vedic books, for example, in, um, or in something like uh, Serpent Power or something like that, you visualize at the bottom of your spine a triangle, an inverted triangle of yellow fire, in which is a lingam, around which is wound three and a half times a serpent with his head down. And you visualize this triangle of fire right in from the bottom of your spine and up from those three nerves, right in a place down in there. Same time keeping everything closed and you're holding your breath and then you go down and you become that yellow triangle of fire and become that serpent. That's all. You just become the serpent. And then just keep holding your breath. And there is a point where you're holding your breath, and when you experience you're holding your breath, you're in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. You forgot what you were supposed to be doing, which is keeping your consciousness at the bottom of your spine. And the high moment, which is very powerful, is when you suddenly remember that and you put your consciousness back on the bottom of your spine, and then suddenly you are not holding your breath and you're not breathing. And usually at that point you say, I'm not breathing. 
and that brings you down. See? In other words, you just did that thing. You took yourself out of the play. So the process is to that it only works when you can make your mind totally one pointed. That's the only time it works. It doesn't work otherwise. You can play it, but it won't work. It is now 20 minutes of one, and I think uh, I was supposed to stop at 12 or something. I'm sorry, I've ruined the schedule. Uh, we meet again at 2.30. And uh, now, the uh, when you're eating, I would suggest if you... Um, Later we'll do a silence exercise, but I think this time, I think we can take our meal in silence. I think that wouldn't hurt us too badly. I See, most of what we talk about is interpersonal stuff. It's just stuff. And it's interesting to sometimes set aside that stuff a little bit. And if you're going to eat, eat consciously. And that means when you're picking up a piece of food, pick up the piece of food. And when you're chewing it, chew it. And when you're savoring it, savoring it. When you're swallowing it, swallowing it. You find out the minute you start to eat consciously that way, you eat just as much as you need. Because that unconscious eating, where you keep eating and eating and eating, and I'll have some more of that, and, that, and all the time you're saying, and don't you think that's terribly interesting, and I'm certainly going to try that, and I certainly want to become conscious, and all the time you're pouring food into your mouth as if, well, after all, I've got to stoke the furnaces for the afternoon. <laughs> That's all illusion, by the way. It's all nonsense. It's all nonsense. So you might as well start out by starting to try to eat consciously. And in the Southern Buddhist method, you can just go through the just observing the process of eating, observing the picking up of the food, and then the putting it in the mouth, and the chewing it, and the savoring it, and the swallowing it, and then the eyeing the next bite, and then the moving in, and then the organizing the food on this fork, and the picking up and the putting it in the mouth and chewing it and savoring it and enjoying it and swallowing it and digesting it okay? and all the pressures in your body, you can just, that's plenty for your consciousness uh, at this point. So I suggest that we take our food consciously, which is a consecrated way of eating. And we'll talk more about consecrating food this afternoon. We meet again at 2.30, is that?
First, in order to center yourself, you pull back from the Divine Mother. But then you figure out that what you pull back into is just another form of the Divine Mother.
for about five days now, I have been singing practically constantly. Engrossed is the bee of my mind. In the blue lotus feet of my divine mother. Engrossed is the bee of my mind in the blue lotus feet of my divine mother. Divine mother, my divine mother, divine mother, my divine mother. I'm driving on a superhighway. And I'm going to Maine, to Colby. I'm on Route 95, and I'm going 90 miles an hour. And I'm looking for police, and the cement is stretching out before me, and I'm looking at my wristwatch, and I'm eating lifesavers or mints or whatever those things are. And I'm looking at the trees and all of this, and I'm thinking about getting to Colby and feeling my back. Then in the midst of all this, I'm singing, engrossed is the bee of my mind in the blue lotus feet of my divine mother. Engrossed is the bee of my mind in the blue lotus feet of my divine mother. Engrossed is the bee of my mind in the blue lotus feet of my divine mother. Now, most people, when they think of divine mothers, they think of some form of motherness. Think of some loving, giving, womanly woman, some earth mother. You've got some earth mother trip you go on. But when I was in the temple, as I've told many of you before, when I was with my guru and he pointed to the women in the room and he said, who are they? And I said, they're your devotees. And he says, no, no, no. I said, they're beautiful Indian women. No, no, no. I said, I don't know, who are they? And he said, ma, they're the mother. So I went through that trip, all women are the mother. Wow, that's beautiful. No, no. Went through a number of changes in my head, re-registering, you know. Look, a beautiful young chick, and she's my mother. Wow, yeah. Wow. I'm just finishing with that, and he points to the sadhus, the men in the room, and he says, who are they? I don't know. And he says, ma. They're all the divine mother. And then, like, wow, that too. So now I'm driving along the road, see, and I'm engrossed as the bee of my mind in the Divine Mother. And the Divine Mother now is the cement road, is the police I'm looking for, is the feeling of the car, it's the body. It's where I'm going to, it's where I came from. It's all part of the Divine Mother. And engrossed is the bee of my mind. Bzz, going from flower to flower, from thing to thing. Mint, drive, cop, heat, accelerator, Colby, Boston, memory, later, before, after, the bee of my mind is engrossed in the blue lotus feet of my divine mother. It's all my divine mother and the lotus feet are, I'm just honoring the feet of my mother. So what I'm doing by singing that now, I'm only singing that because it really turns me on to sing it all day. See, it gets me very high to just keep singing. Engrossed is the bee of my mind and the blue lotus feet of my divine mother. But as a method, what I am doing is I am perceiving all form, all form, in such a way that I am loving and honoring it. 
whatever it is, whatever it is. I'm in New York City the other day, and a, one of those huge honey wagons, big garbage trucks, comes down the street. And I happen to be singing, strangely enough, engrossed is the bee of my mind, the blue lotus seed. And I look at this big garbage truck coming down the street, and there is the Divine Mother. And so I'm standing by the side, and I'm so caught up in my Meshuggah thing <laughs> see, that my hands are spread out. And I'm, ah, oh, see, the garbage truck and the garbage driver is like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what are you doing worshiping my truck? <laughs> mm. Like today, watching yourself eat lunch, watching him or her eat lunch, pick up the food, stick it in the mouth, chew it, taste it, swallow it. And in that Salinger short story, Teddy, little Teddy describes how he first realized how it all was when he saw his little sister drinking milk and he said, I saw her pouring God into God, if you know what I mean. That is just form into form. It's just transformation of energy. Oh, that's all you see, isn't it? One type of form, one type of the Divine Mother eating the other type of the Divine Mother. Now, all that is a method I only do it because it turns me on to do it. I just as soon sing that as anything else. Or I might sing uh, Paul McCartney's Let It Be. And just go on all day long. Let it be, 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 let it be. These are all forms of mantra. All forms of mantra which is a repeated phrase It's designed to keep your consciousness centered. It's a perspective giving device. It's a perspective giving device. I used to drive on trips with Steve Durkee, a friend of mine, and when we'd be lost in a city, Steve would say, well, let's ask Mayor Baba. And the next person we'd see, there would be Mayor Baba. We'd ask him. Now, he'd be whoever he was busy being. He might be a policeman or a gas station attendant or a guy along the side of the road, but there was Mayor Baba always waiting to give us directions. Always waiting, just waiting to give us the directions if we just asked him. All these devices I'm talking about are devices that are part of a form of yoga that one does all day long during one's life process. 
And what it does is allows each moment to become the moment of awakening. It allows each moment to be the moment. So you don't say, I got to rush home to do my yoga. Or I do yoga between six and eight. Or, you know, I, my holy hours are, and then I go to work. I'll hurry and finish my yoga so I can get breakfast in time to get to work on time. And you've got a model in your head of work, see, and then play, and then holy, see, and then dirty, and then secret, and then and you got all these categories in your head, and you divide your day into categories. Like when you're driving, I'm where are you driving? I'm driving to Cumbers. Oh, is that who you are? I am somebody who's driving to Cumbers. All the time you're driving here in order to get instruction, in order to become enlightened, what's happening to you? In fact, every moment at every place you are is exactly the same moment, and it's always this moment. And the game is to keep so conscious that you don't live, you don't get caught in time in the Grim Reaper. You don't get caught in the thing which makes it all somewhere else. When I sing, engrossed is the bee of my mind and the blue lotus feet of my mother, it's all like I'm seeing my mother again for the first time. Wow, you're so beautiful, so much of you, so fantastically seductive and complex and exquisite. And, and it's, it's Kali, it's Kali, uh, the goddess Kali, who is with her tongue dripping blood and a row of skulls around her neck. And in one hand, she's giving birth and in another, she's wielding a knife, which is cutting off heads. She's, she's all process, all form, because all processes change, and change is always, has in it Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. It has in it the creative, the preserving, and the destructive. Every change has in it all three of those things, and they're all part of the Divine Mother. See, and when you're free of identification to any particular form of the Divine Mother, then when you see your own body decay and dying, you don't say, I'm dying. You say, there is transformation of energy. And you just sit, and the transformation of energy goes on. And you just transform into something else. See, you only identify with any particular aspect of the Divine Mother when you fall asleep, when you forget who you are. That's the only time it happens. So the game, of course, is to stay conscious, to stay awake. Now, when you are eating, there's the food and there's you eating. And then what you added today was this being that was aware of you eating food, which is like a triangulation. So there's the you, there's, the, there's your mouth, the body, there's the food, and then there's this awareness watching this process. The game of using the mind to go beyond the mind in daily life, there are two ways of doing this. One is formal meditation, which we'll talk about, and the other is what's called karma yoga. 
And part of karma yoga, the first step of karma yoga is using the rational mind to beat it out, beat itself out. Is adding a third component to every relationship you have with object in the universe. For example, you walking down the street, person approaches, here I am, here's that person. Now there is this looking at me and that person. Okay. Now this could be Om. This could be the sun. This could be Buddha consciousness. This could be called the witness. It's self-remembering in the Gurdjieffian system. It's a technique of adding a third component in order to get free of the identification with either of the other two. It's all a vehicle. It's going to have to go, but it's a useful vehicle. Mantra is such a third factor. In other words, all you do is you add a constant note. You see, if you listen to Indian music, the sitar, for example, play, or the, uh, the uh, shanai, or sarangi, or any of the Indian instruments, you will hear behind it the sound. It's just a continuous It's all It's the center around which the whole operation goes. All things in the system come from the formless into form, back into the formless. So in this case, the third thing is that, and from that, you can see everything going out from it and coming back into it. Created, preserved, destroyed. Each sound comes out of it, goes back into it. Now, a mantra works roughly the same way as a, as a device. That is, that you can use the mantra to find a center in yourself and to keep that third component going, which allows you to watch your own drama all day long. There are so many ways of talking about and teaching mantra, so many ways, because of the same way that mantra, there are many levels at which to understand mantra. For example, a Sanskrit mantra, you could do an, um, an English mantra that we've talked about before, like, Om Ahum is Tibetan, please, please, sorry, thank you, okay, you do. Om Ahum, please, please, sorry, thank you. Om Ahum, please, please, sorry, thank you. Or let it be, 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 let it be. It's all all right. It's 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 all right. Oh, Now, there are different kinds of mantras, however. And the thing about the Sanskrit language is that it was designed consciously and the different sounds are put together for different reasons, which is not the case in English, same one. So that when you do a mantra, a Sanskrit, a Sanskrit mantra or a Tibetan mantra, languages that are consciously evolved, the mantra was designed so that as you keep saying it, it will take you deeper and deeper into a certain kind of vibrational space. Okay. 
some mantras will take you to a power space. They'll take you to an astral plane or a plane, a vibrational rate, where you will develop great powers. I'll give you an English mantra that uh, I've been invested with that is useful for gaining great powers if you happen to want great powers. It's very easy. Just do the mantra. This is, is, I am a point of sacrificial fire held within the fiery will of God. You do that mantra and you bring all the energy to this point and you just keep doing it day after day after day, just all day long. I am a point of sacrificial fire held within the fiery will of God. I am a point of sacrificial fire held within the fiery will of God. I am a point of sacrificial fire held within the fiery will of God. I am a point of sacrificial fire held within the fiery will of God. I am a point of sacrificial fire held within the fiery will of God. And then there are there are general mantras which just keep taking you out and out and out and out. And those are the kinds of mantras I use. Wherever you are, they take you to another plane. Because if you get to a power plane, that's just another part of the illusion of the Divine Mother. It's just another place. Might as well keep going. Because in each case, every new power you got, the game is don't use it. Give it back. And then you go on. The minute you try to grab it or hold on to it or use it, you're stuck. So there are general mantras like Ram, 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 or Om, or Om Mane Padme Hung, Om Mane Padme Hung, or Aditya Hridayam Punyam Savshatru Binashanam, Aditya Hridayam Punyam Savshatru Binashanam, or Gate Gate Paragate Parasamgate Bodhiswaha. That's a Fara one. And that's a Tibetan one. It says, Beyond, beyond the beyond to the homage. On the far side of the ocean of existence, honor. Gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate. You just keep going beyond the, even the model of beyond the beyond. As far as you can think, go one step beyond that one. Okay. Or go in as far as you can go and then keep going and then to that honor. So it keeps sucking you in deeper and deeper and deeper and beyond and beyond the beyond and beyond the beyond and beyond the concept of beyond. Just keep going, weaving your way, weaving your way. Gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhiswaha. Gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhiswaha. Now the value of a mantra a mantra can be, the first when you start to say a mantra, a mantra is, I think we should have things open, by the way, so we keep this room cooler. I don't think this room should get too warm. Would we organize that a little? That a mantra at one level is done, blah, 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 blah. so you hear it out here. Okay. That's the lowest level of the mantra. The next level when you've been doing a mantra for a while is it gets to be sub-vocal. It's right down in here. And then after a while, when you keep doing the mantra, it moves from down here up into your head. So you're thinking about the mantra and doing it. That's still one step away. If you keep on doing it pretty soon, it starts to work automatically from down inside yourself like this. It just keeps going. It's going right around in here. It moves down into here. And pretty soon it becomes quite autonomous. It's very much like a ball bearing thing that you've got rolling inside. And every now and then you just flick it a little bit to keep it going. It's one of those things you just touch it to keep it going. And so what it does is you get this internal voice going that's doing the mantra all the time. And then against that background, you do everything you do in life. But if somebody was saying, what are you doing? You'd say, I'm doing mantra. But aren't you also driving a car? Driving a car is happening, but I'm doing mantra. 
In other words, you identify, just like when you drive a car, you press on the gas and take it off while you're talking. If somebody says, what are you doing? You say, I'm talking. You wouldn't say, I just took my foot off the accelerator because you don't think of that because that's all base brain. It's all going on automatically. In you. Well, in the same way, all the rest of life becomes that and all you're doing consciously is doing the mantra and all the rest is just going down and happening, going under the bridge. A mantra is invested to the extent that it is passed from spirit to spirit. It is passed in the spirit. That is, you can open a number of books like the mantra Om Manne Pedme Hung, which we can work with for a little while. That mantra, you can go out and buy Lama Govinda's book, Foundations of Tibetan Mysticism. And that whole book is dedicated to the mantra Om Manne Pedme Hung. And you can read the book and absolutely nothing will happen. If you are already in the spirit and you see that mantra once, it all has happened. That is, the secrets of all methods lie not in the fact that there are secrets that nobody tells you, they're secrets and that you can't receive them. And your openness to receiving is part of whether or not the mantra can be invested. And the next thing is the nature of the spirit of the being that's investing it. That is, I can't teach you a mantra that I myself don't do. But if I'm doing a mantra and it works for me, and so that every time I do the mantra, I immediately move into a psychic space where I can see the Divine Mother's dance and at the same moment keep my center, then what I transmit to you when I teach the mantra is my own ability to use it. And one of the horrendous things that one sees, we see, I see, I am often, get caught in that horror of teaching beyond where you're at, of knowing something intellectually and trying to transmit it. And what you really do is you destroy its usefulness for the other person in a way. Because they get it, like many people who got mantras through various techniques, were given the mantra without the spirit. That is, they were given a mantra, but they didn't open themselves to the person that gave it, and the person that gave it wasn't there really doing it high enough. And the result is that they got the mantra and that it didn't work. And that makes them more resistant to using mantra in the future. It's like they're using up a method. It's like you get all ready to take LSD and you're all excited and somebody gives you some bum acid. And you take it, nothing happens. And from then on, you've got a whole different attitude than you had at that moment when you were really wide open. So you've got to understand that investing, it's like, um, um, Valmiki, the poet who wrote uh, the Ram Ramayana, was given the, uh, the story of Ram. He was given the mantra Ram, Rama, 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 Rama. But when he got, got it, he heard it in this funny way. So it's Rama, 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 Rama. And he heard Ma, Rama, 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 instead of Rama, Rama, Rama. And Mara is the name of the devil. And so for 10 or 20 years, he just went around all day long saying Mara, 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 Mara. And he became enlightened through doing that because it had been invested with a, with a purity and he was using it with a purity and it was beyond the form of the thing. He was just, he had, the spirit was passing through through that vehicle. It was the purity with which, that's called transmuting energy. When you're pure enough, you can take anything that comes in and you can make it into something else because of your ability to transmute. Like last evening, I was helping pack some boxes in a car, very heavy boxes. And in the course of it, one of the boxes caught on my mala, and the mala ripped, and some of the beads fell off. And this was right in the middle of Beacon Street in Boston. And I picked up all the beads. Now, these are beads that came from my guru, and they're beads I've been treasuring for years, and they're like, they're my thing, they're my beads, okay, they're my security blanket. They're my connection with them. Right. 
And when I finally get up to the apartment and I spread out all the beads, instead of 108, there's only 107. Now, they've broken a dozen times before, but I always end up with 108, but now there's only 107. So I take a flashlight and I'm walking up and down Beacon Street. You know, the bead's about this big, you know, and I'm down in the gutters looking and people are figuring, oh, wow, another weird one, you know, and he must have taken acid and he must be, you know. And, and I'm looking for this bead and I'm under cars and I'm really thinking it's going to be anywhere and I'm, I'm going to find the bead. I must be supposed to find it. And I didn't find the bead. So now I got 107 beads. Okay. So I realize I'm not going to find the bead and I go through, oh, you're so corrupt. You've allowed a bead to be lost. You weren't conscious. You obviously weren't conscious. That's waking you up. And so on. And I'm going through all kinds of guilt and beating myself. And you're no good. And then I think, I go, then I'm around my stepmother and she's feeling so badly I've lost the bead that I'm calming her. It's all right. It's just a bead, you know, and I'm going through that thing. <laughs> And I go through, well, obviously Beacon Street needed the bead. <laughs> that that energy, that high force that these beads represented has to be spread around. And then I began to think, where will I put the other 107? <laughs> like, I ought to go around and plant these beads in different parts of the world and just keep, they're like a moss. They'll sit in certain spaces and just emit prawn, you know. And now Beacon Street's covered. You don't have to worry anymore. <laughs> Now, by the time I had finished, I was so high over losing that bead. See? Instead of all night long, oh, God, I've lost the bead. You know, that's what happened the first time I lost one of the beads, which I then found, was for days I went around in a, depra in a blue funk, you know, <laughs> driving around in a blue funk. <laughs> oh, my God, I've lost. I'm no good. What will I tell them? You know, what will I tell them? <laughs> Thing is how long it takes you to take something that gets in your way and realize that the things that most hang you up are your greatest teachers. They are the things that really teach you where you're not. And the more fiercely they hang you up, the better teachers they are, obviously, because they're showing you how deeply attached you were to something or other. They're teaching you about your attachment. Now, that doesn't mean I won't work to preserve my bead. But when the bead's gone, okay, here we are. There is now a new existential situation called 107 beads. Right? <laughs> That's the way it is. Now, I can either say, well, I'll make believe I have 108, or I'll quick make another one to make it look like 108, or I can do a whole thing of denial or a whole compensatory mechanism. Or at the other place, I can take the loss of the bead and convert it in some way so that I get high off it. Now, that seems easy with beads, as long as they're my beads and not yours. But everybody's got a thing. Everybody's got their beads. See, somebody comes along and you're busy... Um, whatever you're doing, let's say you're playing the flute. See, and you really are playing the flute to give everybody great pleasure. And every and the, you're doing your flute thing. Somebody comes along and says, say, would you mind not playing the flute? <laughs> and your ego goes through this, you know, like, like suddenly you are being put down and it's a terror, you know, you go through it. Now, how long does it take you before you can see how that statement woke you up? And you can turn to the person and say, thank you. Most of us are very socialized, so we can say, oh, I'm sorry if I'm disturbing you. But all the time inside, he doesn't like my flute playing. And every time you see where your ego is, wow, groovy, you just woke up again. Because karma yoga is the yoga of getting free of all the places you're not, of all the attachments you've got. Mm -hmm. And therefore, every time somebody advises you of where you're not, wow, that's groovy. That's speeding up the process of getting free of attachment. So if somebody just wipes your ego out, wow, boy, have they done a service for you.
That's transmuting energy. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, do what you do, but offer the fruits of your action to me. In other words, do it all as an offering to Krishna, to your own higher consciousness. So you're playing the flute, you're playing the flute for Krishna. Somebody says, stop playing the flute, you stop playing the flute, you stop playing the flute for Krishna. In other words, you develop a center from which form, non-form, change, all is just happening. You don't identify any more with he who is playing the flute than with he who is not playing the flute. It's just process. It happens at that moment there was flute and there was you and there was... It was flute time. And then it isn't flute time. And it's no more or less than that. Once you get a mantra that you feel comfortable in working with, that mantra will keep you with a place which will allow you to transmute. It starts to allow you to transmute energy. That's what it does. And to know how it works, you really have to do it. And to do it, you have to let it happen to you. You've got to be it. Now, in doing a mantra, I use mala, M-A-L-A, -A, also known as rosary bead. In scientific circles, it's known as a heuristic device for cognitive centering. You can call it whatever you like. It's a, it's a set of beads, right? And the way I use them, when you're doing Tibetan mantras, you use your left hand. When you're doing Hindu mantras, you do your right hand. You don't use your pointing finger, and so on. There are all kinds of little games about mantras you can follow and not follow. You, when you're doing mantra, you go from the guru bead, which is the main bead, you go all the way around to the, whatever the last one is, in this case, 107. And then you turn and you go back around. You don't go by the guru bead. That's another game. You don't go in a circle. You go in a spiral. You're constantly doing this thing. You're climbing this ladder of consciousness. So you start and it's, we'll do om manne pedne hon, om manne pedne hon, om manne pedne hon. Now, when you're doing this, after a while, the question is, what is the relation from this to this? Well, at first, this is merely, it's like a mudra. It's a ha it's a body thing that helps center you. It's like one man band where you're doing it all, all parts of you are doing this process together. After a while, it becomes like an external reminder. You're just sort of sitting around, and I might be talking to you, and I might get so involved in what I'm saying that it's just so terribly important that I get it across to you, and I'm right in the middle of my... And I suddenly feel my fingers moving by, and then up out of my bowels comes... And then I look at the intensity with which I was caught, and it centers me. again. In other words, my hand sometimes is the reminder of the mantra, because the mantra is like waves. It goes under and it comes back up. Then it goes under and it comes back up. Then it goes under and it comes back up. But it sits down in deep and it'll keep welling up. Like when I'm asleep, when I come into consciousness, the first thing I come into every morning isn't in my mantra. It's just a very natural thing. I'm sleeping with a the beads on my chest and I'm, I'm in my deep sleep where I'm not yet able to be conscious. And then I come into dream state, and as I come into the dream state, I... Then the mantra cranks up and starts going, or comes out again where it's been lurking. And then the, the, the dreams go on, or the day starts, or whatever happens, happens against the background of the mantra.
invest you with a mantra. The mantra Om Manne Padme Hong. Doing this mantra, you start the mantra from your Manipura, your third chakra. And it's a process of bringing energy up your chakras. So you start in the third chakra, and it's as if also you can have the image of a huge bucket. And you dip the bucket into the well of pran, and then you bring the pran up your spine, and then you pour it into your heart. Then you go down for another bucket and you bring the bucket up and pour it into your heart and go down for another bucket and bring it up and pour it into your heart. So it's Om Mane Padme Hung. Om Mane Padme Hung. Now, Om, you're familiar with. Om is the, all the sounds of the universe. It's the unmanifest. It's God in his unmanifest form. Mane is the jewel. Hedme, lotus, hung, manifest, or heart. Om ah hung. Om unmanifest, imminent manifest. Hung is the manifestation in the heart. The idea is it's concerned with what's called the Atman. The Atman is the place in you, your Hridayam, your spiritual heart, where all of it is, the whole universe is in. It's your sun inside. It's the place out of which it all comes in you. So what you're saying is the entire universe is like a jewel right in the center of the lotus. Thinking of the petals of the lotus as the body and the senses and the thoughts. And that center is right here in my heart. So you're saying God resides in my very heart. You're saying Om is manifest in my very heart. That's what the mantra means. There are many levels of the mantra. There's a whole book, as I say, you can read about. It. Now, at first, when you're doing it, you're thinking about it. You're thinking, Om Manne Padme Hung, Om Unmanifest Jewel Lotus Heart, Unmanifest Jewel Lotus Heart. And then after a while, all that's gone away, and just the mantra itself keeps doing it. And these vibrational rates of the mantra start to take you over, and they bring you into a space, and in that space, everything in the universe looks different. That's the way it works. A mantra has its own psychic space. And furthermore, if you do it purely enough and let yourself into it deep enough and really do it with Om Mane Padme Hung, you tune in on the place where it is and then you start to hear all of the other beings who have ever done it purely. Because if you want to go out a little further, you've got to realize that everything that is started in the universe goes on forever. All form that's manifest. That's what karma is. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. And therefore, all of the times that's ever been said are around. And when you can hear that, you tune in on what's called the Akashic sound of the Omkar, which is the place where Om is. And when it first happens to you, it really blows your mind, I'll tell you. It's a very extraordinary experience. The pronunciation is Tibetan. In this case, even though the spelling would be spelled as if you were pronouncing it in Sanskrit. So it's Om Manne. Manne with the back of the nose closed. Manne. It's against the roof of the mouth. Manne. Manne. Head me. Head me. Head me. Hung as if it were spelled H N U N G. Hung. Hung. And the hung, when it's working right, resonates in your chest. You will feel it vibrate in your chest. Hung. It's done with the back of the nose totally closed. Hung. 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 Now, I'm going to start doing it, and we're going to do it for a little while, and I will just let myself into it, and just listen, and as you feel it, let it be. Let it manifest from you. You don't do a mantra. You tune in on a mantra. Right? You tune in on the mantra.
Remember, up, up and into your heart. Up and into your heart.
Continuing the mantra, take one of your arms and just move your arm, but keep the mantra going and watch your arm from the mantra. Keep the mantra going, don't stop it. Do it with your eyes closed, just...
Now feel the entire orientation of your body, keeping the mantra going from within the mantra. See your spine, how you're sitting, knees, thighs, legs, body, head, neck, chest. Keep the mantra going. Hear the baby from within the mantra. All the sounds, my voice, keep the mantra going. Keep the mantra going, watch your own breathing. Formally, the exercise is completed. You may stop the mantra. Or well, you may keep it going forever. That's up to you. You can look at each other and do it with the mantra going, you see. Om Mane Padme Hung, Om Mane Padme Hung, Om Mane Padme. I'll show you an example, a little exercise. See if you can find somebody near you and just look into their eyes. And when you do it, don't try to do anything interpersonal. Just do the mantra. Okay. Everybody pick the person to the, hi, oh, you can't do it that way. Can you? <laughs> well, everybody be rational and find somebody next to them if they can. And if they can't, they can't. But see if there's somebody next to you or near you whose eyes you can look in, preferably somebody you've never met before. That's groovy doesn't matter. Don't get into an interpersonal relation. Just look, look right between the eyes, right at the ajna, and by looking between the eyes, you will see both eyes. And don't try to say, here I am. Are you there? I love you. Hello. Nice day. Aren't we having fun? Never mind any of that. Just look into eyes and do om manne pedme hong, om manne pedme hong. But keep consciously together. Keep consciously with each other's eyes. The upper lip of the other person. Don't look in their eyes anymore. Now look at the upper lip of the other person. And just let their face change. And just keep doing Om Mane Padme Hone. And any time you see them, just... Let it pass. Just let it keep passing. Just let it keep changing. Look into their eyes. The lip. Let the face just keep changing. All Monday, Thursday. I just want to demonstrate these little exercises to you. Now, just take the hand of anybody near you, close your eyes, and just hold the hand very gently, anybody's hand, it doesn't matter, any loose hand that happens to be around. Somebody may end up with two hands being held, or you never know. <coughs> just take a hand and keep the mantra going. And then notice the hand, but at the same time, keep the mantra going. Stay in the mantra but let the hand be in contact. Feel handness.
and every thought form you have about the hands, just let it pass, and that one too. Suddenly feel you're holding a piece of raw meat. Right, and let it pass. You feel the delicacy of the skin, groovy, let it pass. Feel the weight, the lightness, the blood, the energy, human contact, the love, the vibration. Sure, any form, any label you can get, let it pass back into the mantra. Keep clear, clearing the whole system with the mantra. Go back to the mantra. End of exercise. <laughs> we'll now stretch for about a couple of minutes and stand up and the thing. And but um, it wouldn't hurt you to keep the mantra going. <laughs> You get so, by the way, that you learn how to be able to look into somebody else's eyes without freaking all the time. Right? Most people, when they look into somebody else, when, I, when people come to see me all the time, I just sit there, see, and I'm sitting very quietly, I'm going, oh, my knees, oh, my knees, fed me. And I look into their eyes, and they start to say, well, what I came to see you about was, <laughs> by, I've been terribly disturbed about, and I don't really know, you know, and they're going through these extraordinary number of visual movements. And they flick back to your eyes, and you're just sitting there. And then they flick away, and then they come back, and there you are. You're still there. Go away, and keep coming back. And it's like a, it's like a, a bug sort of centering in, vibrating in, until pretty soon they calm down, until they just, like, here. Now, everybody can calm down into your eyes to the extent that you aren't caught in an interpersonal melodrama. If you're caught in interpersonal melodrama, you'll arouse paranoia in them because you are coming on to them somehow or other. Whatever your role, it's either let me take care of you or let me go to bed with you or let me, do you love me or I'm here, are you there or whatever the trip is. And it's all just more melodrama. But when you keep the mantra going, you can look into somebody's eyes and at first they think, you can see, you can see all their thoughts go by when you can stay in the mantra.